for the homework, for the mastery set for this, uh, this first problem. I guess we didn't specify that fi were convex here, but uh, I, I'll write that in sometime after the lecture. So if you're, if you're confused about the generality here, we meant to put convex functions, not necessarily differentiable. Okay, so that was just kind of a small point. Um, do we have any announcements that I'm forgetting about? Next Tuesday, the homework's due, right? Or this upcoming Tuesday? I got that wrong last time, but I told you it's due today, but nobody was fooled. And so Donna has your exams. If you'd like to to get them, I mean, you should get them because they'll be they're a good study tool for the for the little test, which is coming up a week from next Tuesday. Any questions about anything? Okay, so today's lecture is, uh, I think it's going to be a, a fun lecture. Um, we're going to kind of give a survey of problems. And we're not going to go into too much depth into any one problem, but um, I thought it would be a nice way to kind of finish off a course in which we talked primarily about convex optimization uh, to talk about some non-convex problems that we know how to solve exactly. So it's cheesy, I know, but the, the lecture title is Non-Convex NP. NP here means no problem, doesn't mean like NP hard. You got to give me some slack. Was, I wasn't. Okay, so th this might be a, a typical picture of the, the optimization world after coming out of this class. You know, we have this, uh, it would be nicer if this iceberg actually was convex up there. But we have this, <laughs> you know, this section of problems where it's bright and it's warm and we know how to solve them. And we have all these tools. And actually, it's so plentiful that we can choose between tools. We had lectures about, should we use this method or that method? And they all might work, but what works best? And the math is typically very clean. We can characterize things with the KKT conditions. We have all these nice um, features of, of both algorithms and, and of our analysis of problems. And then below the surface is this like gigantic you know, uh, portion of problems that's the non-convex world. And so really, for any convex problem that you know how to solve, there are innumerable non-convex problems that are very similar to it that are very difficult to solve. And so you know, it, might, it might feel like if you're solving non-convex problems, you're in kind of like this dark, cold water, and there's not much you can do, and it's heuristic. And, uh, and so what we're going to see today is that um, there are problems that are very non-convex, so they may, they may go deep down this water, but we know how to solve exactly. So this is not really a totally fair picture. And, uh, and it's a, you know, non-convex problems are a very active topic of research. There are a lot of nice tools, both for uh, general problems and for very specific instances. So just a, a maybe a little broader perspective after we spend a, a semester talking about convex optimization. So here are some takeaway points um, that, that we'd like to uh, have you think about after you know, gone through, going through this semester of convex problems. So the first is that if it's possible, formulate a task in terms of convex optimization, if it's possible. Because it's typically easier to solve and easier to analyze. Right, and so we don't really need to argue that that's the case, um, given that we've kind of done that all semester. But the, the key is that you know, if it's possible or if it's reasonable. Right, so if you have two formulations, either one of which might look like it's going to solve the problem to the same level of statistical accuracy, or whatever else your goal is, you should, you should think about the convex one first. But an equally important point is that uh, you know, non-convex does not necessarily mean non-scientific. So I was actually in a, in a talk um, given by a, a very respectable, I'd call him a statistician or maybe a machine learning researcher. And uh, he said, if it's not convex, then it's not science. And it was that strong. It was a, kind of a very um, dogmatic statement about how important it is to do convex optimization. And that's not always the case. That's not always true. It may seem like if we're in the non-convex world, like I said, we're doing this heuristic, these kind of heuristic tricks. Um, but there are principled tools, general tools, to try to attack non-convex problems. You guys would have learned, um, uh, what, what did you cover when I was gone? Uh, we didn't cover them yet. So <laughs> oh. But you didn't do simulated annealing? We didn't do 
Well, so the notes are there. For, okay, so <laughs> you can learn simulated <laughs> annealing and other techniques that, you know, they have, there are people who write books about these topics. They're, they can be very principled. Um, but it is kind of worth pointing out that statistically, non-convex does usually mean higher variance. Because you're not guaranteed um, the same solution each time because there are local optima, you might find or you will likely find different solutions depending on where you start or maybe what kind of random instance of data you observe. And that just inflates the variance of your estimates. Right? So every time I, I observe data, I might have an estimator now that I compute with higher variance because it comes from a non-convex problem. So that could contribute to a degraded error rate, but it all depends on the problem. And so this is what we're talking about today. In many cases, maybe more than you'd expect, you can solve non-convex problems to global optimality. And, and we're going to give a bunch of examples today of that. All right, so first, um, what does it mean for a problem to be non-convex? This is kind of an interesting point that was actually brought up by one of your TAs. Um, you know, we have this generic convex optimization problem. F is convex, HI are convex functions, and the LI we make, or the LJ we require to be affine, right? That's our, um, our form of a convex optimization problem. A non-convex problem, we're going to say, is one of this form. So it's minimized some F subject to HI less than or equal to 0 and subject to LJ equal to 0. But it's where um, not all of these assumptions are met on the functions. So you know, F could be non-convex, HI could be non-convex, LJ could be non-affine. But importantly, um, we're going to consider non-convex problems that are not trivially equivalent to convex ones. Okay, because I can always take a convex problem and do something really silly and turn it into a non-convex problem, and it, it, it'll be trivially equivalent. So what's an example of that? Um, let's suppose I have this problem, right? H less than equal to h of x less than equal to zero, and l of x equal to zero. Um, I could just introduce another variable, say y. I could write, you know, some extremely ugly uh, non-convex function, and I could put in a constraint that f of y equals zero. Right? That's the same problem. I haven't changed anything. Y is is, is useless here. But according to our formulation, it's not convex because the criterion is not convex, and because this is not a linear equality constraint. Okay, so I can always kind of do something silly and, and turn a convex problem into a non-convex one. So really, when we talk about non-convex problems, we mean one. We mean problems in which, um, if there's a convex equivalent problem, it's not trivial, and that's really important because often what we're going to see is that non-convex problems can be relaxed to convex problems. And, sol and the convex problem can be solved to get the same solution as the non-convex one, but it's recognizing that relaxation that's the hard part. That's really the, the kind of the key, is recognizing that connection in the first place. Um, how about solving a non-convex problem? So we know that, uh, that generically for non-convex problems, I can find some feasible point x that looks like it's optimal, in a, a ball around x that contains feasible points. So for every y you know, sufficiently close to x that's feasible, it can look like uh, x is better than y, all, all such y with respect to f. But x could still not be globally optimal. This is just the definition of a local optimum point. And so we proved this couldn't happen for convex problems, but it can happen for non-convex problems. So when we talk about solving a non-convex problem in this lecture, we're going to talk about getting the global optimum. Okay. And in some cases, like I said, we, we, we can relax the, uh, the non-convex problem to a convex one, in which case we're really just finding, we're looking for one solution, which is going to be the global one. And kind of implicitly, although we won't talk about running times for every problem, it's implicit that we mean doing it efficiently. So you can think about like in polynomial time. Because you know, some combinatorial problems, we can get the global optimal global optimum is by just enumerating all possibilities, but that's not really an algorithm, right? It's not, it's not going to run for any uh, reasonably sized inputs. So that's just basically the, the setup of today's lecture. And all right, so just an addendum before we start. Um, the goal was really just to put together a list of interesting problems that you might look back on, you know, say next year or some other time when you're thinking about your own research that are surprisingly tractable. Problems that may look difficult, but actually 
with, um, by recognizing a, a certain kind of structure or, or maybe a relationship to a, a different problem, um, they end up being tractable. And so there's going to be exceptions about non-convexity. I'll talk about some problems that are convex, but that are really hard and reduced to, to simple, simpler co convex problems. And maybe I'll, at the end, if I get to it, I'll talk a bit about um, problems in which we don't get exactly the global optima, but kind of good enough for statistical purposes. And I'm, I'm sure there are more examples that are out there that I've missed. So um, what I suggest is that after this lecture, if you think there's a cool problem that I missed, just send me an email. And um, you know, maybe if, if it turns out that it's a good one to add to the list, I'll have you make a couple of slides on it. And we can put it into this LaTeX and just kind of keep a repository of, of these interesting problems that are um, outside of, of our, that fall outside of the applications that we learned in the class so far. So here, here's an outline for what we're going to talk about. Um, I kind of sectioned it up into these seven uh, categories, although it's kind of arbitrary. And there's just way too many examples, it turned out, um, that I generated to talk about. Um, so we're just going to go through some of them that maybe based on how interesting it looks like people are responding to them. And maybe um, if people, if people uh, have a preference for seeing one of these problems that I end up skipping, just let me know, and I can go over it carefully. So he here are the classes of problems. Um, classical, I'm calling them classical kind of core non-convex problems. So these are problems that you'd find in kind of a classical literature for optimization. And so I don't mean like old-fashioned. That's why I wanted to call it core, because there's still people who are working on these problems. Then eigen pr problems is another large class of problems. Graph problems, non-convex proximal operators, um, discrete problems, infinite dimensional problems, and then this last one is kind of a bad name, but I couldn't think of anything else, statistical problems. So these are problems in which we don't quite get the global optimum, but good enough for statistical purposes. All right, so here's our, just jumping into it, here's our um, first class of non-convex problems. Um, we're going to start off pretty simple, linear fractional programs. So these are, are uh, look like LPs, right? I have a, a linear inequality constraint and a linear equality constraint, but the objective is not a single linear function. It's actually um, the ratio of two linear functions. Okay, so it's not hard to show that that um, objective function is quasi-convex. What does quasi-convex mean? Do people remember what that means? Anybody? Function is quasi-convex if all of its sublevel sets are convex sets. So let's just take this function. Cx plus d over e transpose x plus f. And let's look at all this, the set of all x for which um, this is less than or equal to some value alpha. This is the sublevel set of this function. And if this is a convex set for every alpha, then um, this function is called quasi-convex. So this is weaker than convexity. Every convex function is quasi-convex, but not vice versa. In fact, this one's not convex, but it is quasi-convex. So is this a convex set? How do we show this is a convex set? Oh, um, the domain, right? explicitly written in here is a set of all points for which E transpose X and E transpose X plus F is bigger than zero. So that was important. So how do we show this is quasi-convex? Or the, sorry, how do we show this set is convex? Any thoughts? Right. I just multiply both sides by E transpose X plus F. Right, and so this is, um, this guy is itself a closed half space. If I just rearrange in terms of X, and this is an open half space. So it's the intersection of two half spaces, and it's, it's, so it's convex. Right, so this function is quasi-convex. So this is not quite a convex optimization problem, but it's quasi-convex. Um, so the first result, um, or I guess the only result about this problem that we're going to see is that if this problem is feasible, so if I have 
uh, if there exists an x that satisfies these constraints, then it's actually equivalent to a linear program. I can just make this into an LP, which maybe is a bit surprising, um, given the fact that it looks so different from an LP like this. But, um, but here's the linear program. And so the theme of today's lecture is that I'm just trying to give a survey, and I'm not going to go through the derivations for this, but I'm gonna, I put all the references in the slides where you can find this. Um, essentially, the link between these two problems is these, are these variable transformations. So this y and this c are the new optimization variables in this linear program. Okay, so for example, if you just do c transpose y plus d transpose z, if these are y and z, then you'll see the objective function is just c transpose x um, plus d over e transpose x plus f. Right, so the objective functions are the same. And then you, you, show, you can show the problems are the same as well. Uh, no. So uh, you can't transform any quasi-convex problem into a convex problem. Um, it's a strictly kind of broader class of problems. Yeah, right. So by section or something like that. So are you asking something more general than this? Yeah. So the, I mean, sli slightly more general is that the number of, say, linear inequality constraints here can be infinite. And so then I still get the same equivalence to an LP. Actually, it, would, it wouldn't be an LP, but it would be um, a problem with a linear objective, and the constraint here would be a polyhedron um, or some convex set that is polyhedral. And uh, I think there's another generalization that uh, is in, the, the, in Boyd's book that changes the objective function to a maximum of linear functions. So then it's like a polyhedral objective with polyhedral constraints. But I, I don't know how far you can push this. That's a good question. I mean, I would just recommend taking a look at uh, chapter four of the textbook. There's probably some references there. So uh, people probably think this is kind of a weird problem. You know, so a lot of the problems we'll talk about look more commonplace, but this one maybe not so much. So I wanted to point out that linear fractional programs, they actually arise in statistics when you study um, the solution paths of many adaptive estim estimation problems. So for example, we talked about the lasso problem a lot in this class. Um, here I've drawn a picture of the lasso solution as a function of lambda. So the, the x-axis here is, is lambda. And the y-axis is the value of beta for a different components of the lasso solution. So red, blue, dark blue, and black are all different components. And you can actually derive the values of lambda exactly at which variables enter the model. Right? So we know that generally as I make lambda smaller, I am placing less weight on the L1 penalty, so more variables come into the model. You can actually drive an explicit form for these values of lambda. And it turns out that actually finding these values of lambda, those are linear fra fractional programs. So they rise in statistics. And uh, you can take a look at this reference. Um, it's much more general than the lasso. Kind of figuring out uh, values of knots in solution paths is kind of deeply related to linear fractional programs. So the fact you can turn them into LPs is, is pretty helpful. So the next class of problems, and this one is, um, I think, a little bit more sophisticated, and, and I think it's a lot more studied, are geometric programs um, that are um, non-convex, but that we can transform into convex problems. So this takes a little bit of um, introduction. So we're going to consider functions that look like um, I have some vector x, all its components are positive, and I just raise x to um, real valued powers. So these can be fractional, they can be negative, they can be anything. Right? It's just x1 to the a1 all the way through xn to the an, where these a's are constants and x's are our optimization variables. And I'm going to multiply that by some real valued coefficient or positive coefficient c. We're going to call that a, a monomial. Okay? And a polynomial is a sum of these functions. So I just take, um, say, capital or a p of these, and I add them together. That's a polynomial. OK, so this, uh, if, I, if I take our current kind of generic form for convex optimization, but I allow f and hi's to be polynomial, and I force the lj's to be monomial, then that's called um, a geometric program. OK, and so it's not a convex problem. Now, you can just come up with a very simple instance in which it's not convex to convince yourself, even with two variables, say x and y. 
right? For example, the objective function could be um, like x squared over y to the cubed or something, or even just x cubed, right? That's not that's already not convex. So um, there's a very simple transformation to turn this into a, a convex problem. And all we do is that we let um, log of xi be equal to yi. And our new optimization variable is going to be called yi. So remember, f was this, as the uh, product of x1 to some power times x2 to some power, et cetera. I just plug in e to the y1 to that power, e to the y2 to that power, um, in place of where I saw x, the x size. And I end up getting, it looks like, e to some vector a. a just has, right, these are the components of a, transpose y plus b. Because this is just the sum of a i, y i. And this b, I'm going to just call um, log c. So e to the b is equal to c. OK, so just by making that transformation from, x, uh, from xi to yi via this log, li this log link, I, I can reparameterize the problem like this. And this made sense because I was forcing x to be positive here as part of um, the implicit domain of the optimization problem. So that means I can write any posynomial as a sum of these, if this is what a monomial looks like. right? Because posynomials are just sums of monomials. And that means I can take any geometric program, and I can write it in terms of y, not x now, as a sum of e to linear functions subject to a sum of e to linear functions being less than or equal to 1, and e to a linear function being equal to 1. So this is almost convex. What's the one more kind of step we have to do from here to make it convex? On the equality constraint. Um, yeah, and, and uh, where else do I take logs? Actually, I, I suppose it doesn't really. Yeah, so I, I wrote it by taking logs of everything. So the equality constraint, um, this becomes G tra gj transpose y plus hj equals 0. And um, the objective function, the constraints were all in terms of logs as well. And just relied on the fact that one of the formulations we know is that log of a sum of exponentials is a convex function. Okay, so th this is the same problem as our original problem. And if we solve this in terms of y, then we can take um, xi to be uh, e to the yi, right, for every value of i, and we get the solution to the geometric program. So there's a, uh, the author of your textbook wrote this long kind of um, review paper called a tutorial on geometric programming, which is very nice and goes over a very kind of detailed um, perspective of, of the field of geometric, geometric programming and where, where it's applied. Um, Savrit Sra, who's actually visiting us this year in ML, um, and one of his co-authors this year, have a paper on NIPS that's basically on geometric programming for matrices. So you can do the same thing, but for matrices. It's a lot trickier because um, matrix powers are a lot trickier than just powers of numbers. But uh, it's, it's, very nice. it's a very nice extension. And he's also teaching the, one of the advanced, he's one of the professors who's teaching the advanced optimization um, course next semester. So if you're interested, you should pay attention to, uh, to that course. So I just wanted to mention that uh, there are a bunch of problems that are geometric programs that aren't obviously convex. One of them is floor planning. So this is part of the, um, the tutorial that Steve Boyd wrote. Um, and basically, let's suppose I have a bunch of rectangles. And uh, I know they each should have some area. But I'm not going to constrain their width and their heights, only their area. And I want to pack them into a space, make a floor plan in a way that they don't overlap. And maybe um, the amount of white space in the bounding box left over is minimal, or something like that. That's a floor planning problem. And I can pose that explicitly as a geometric program. And so, if I told you that these boxes don't, can't overlap, then my first thought would be that, that this would be a combinatorial optimization problem. Right? There would be something now that involves, I have to look at all pairs of boxes, and they can't overlap. And I would have guessed that this would not have been not convex. But you can cast it as a geometric program, which itself isn't convex, but it's equivalent to a convex problem. So people uh, apparently um, solve problems like this all the time with geometric programs.
Okay, so the, the next kind of core or, uh, or classic um, problem is the one of just taking a convex equality constraint and turning it into an inequality constraint. So this is actually uh, quite common. So if I have this convex problem, uh, or if I have convex f and convex hi, and I let L be convex but not affine, that this itself is not a convex problem as we've defined it. Right? For example, if I had um, a norm equality constraint on my optimization variable, or if my optimization, op optimization variable was x, then as written, this isn't a convex problem, right? Because that equality constraint is not affine. But what happens is a lot of times, if you can prove that the solution to this problem is always tight with respect to this constraint, meaning that at the solution it always has to be equal to um, 1 in terms of its norm, then I can relax it to this problem, I can solve this convex problem, and then I know that I have the solution to the original non-convex problem, which had the, right, the equality constraint on x. So this isn't always true. I mean, this is definitely not always true, but in, in many cases, if you think about um, the problem carefully, this kind of relaxation can be done. So um, I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through this example. But here's an example where it's obvious that you can relax the equality constraint to an inequality constraint just based on your intuition. This is a problem that involves kind of utility. And so what relaxation means is that you can throw out money. And if you want to maximize your utility in terms of money, you never throw away money. So the intuition is there, but then it, just, it just have to re requires you to actually prove that by relaxing it, the solution to the inequality constraint problem lies at the boundary of that constraint. Um, OK, so here, here's, I think this is the last, yeah, the last of the, non, of the kind of classic core problems that's non-convex, but that in many cases we can solve exactly um, if I have a problem that involves two quadratics, so I missed writing something here, the, line, the second line should say subject to this quadratic, x transpose a1x plus 2b1 transpose x plus c1 less than or equal to 0, um, then this is convex, right? If a and a0 and a1 are positive definite matrices, but if I, if I say they don't have to be positive definite, then it's no longer a convex problem. Right? A quadratic is only convex uh, so long as it's the quadratic form is positive semi-definite. Right? Take two derivatives. The Hessian is the quadratic form itself. And so it has to be positive semi-definite in order for the problem to be convex. So this problem, where I should have a less than or equal to 0 up here, and, uh, and, and with the without the condition that a0 and a1 need to be positive definite is not convex. But it turns out that we can actually derive its dual problem, which is an SDP. And so that's done actually in the appendix of your textbook. And you can show that strong duality holds between this non-convex problem and its dual. Its dual is convex because duals are always convex. So that doesn't quite exactly mean that I can solve the original problem. It means that the optimal criterion values of the two problems are the same. But if I want the solution itself to this problem, then I actually need to, I still need to derive the primal solution from the dual solution, which requires me to look at basically the stationarity condition, right, for this problem. And so in many cases, I can get an explicit primal solution from a dual solution. So you can solve a lot of problems of this form um, using strong duality. And uh, there's, this is an active topic of research, so there's papers that, for example, consider this problem but with two non-convex quadratics. So if I have two non-convex quadratic inequality constraints, strong duality can be shown still to hold, and you can still get um, optimal solutions to this primal problem. And I think th this paper also even considers um, complex value and optimization variables. So it's quite a general phenomenon beyond this simple case. OK, um, so here's a, a, a pretty big class. They're all going to look similar, but I think they're actually all fairly impressive if you think about um, their influence. I mean, we see eigenproblems all the time. So here's a, a kind of what I would think of as a very generic 
um, statistical optimization problem that's non-convex, but we always think of as completely solvable, because it is. And that's principal component analysis. So if you give me a matrix Y, let's say it's N by P, um, and you ask me, suppose, to find the, the matrix X, which is also N by P, that's closest to Y in Frobenius norm. So this is just this, you know, sums the this, um, differences between Y and X squared element-wise, subject to the constraint that rank of X is equal to K. So X has to be a rank K matrix. So I want the best rank K approximation to Y, where K is fixed. So this is non-convex, this problem. And it's because of this, in a, this equality constraint here. Um, what if I had rank X less than or equal to K? Would that still be uh, non-convex, or would it be convex? Who thinks it would be um, non-convex? So why is that non-convex? OK. Yeah. Well, so let's just come up with a really simple example. I have to know that basically rank, for example, alpha x plus 1 minus alpha z is going to be always less than or equal to rank plus 1 minus alpha rank z for any two matrices, x and z, and numbers alpha. So here's an example that'll get into that's definitely not the case. So both of these matrices are rank 1, right? Their column space is only one-dimensional. But I take any linear combination of them where the weights aren't a 0, 1, then I get a rank 2 matrix. So this rank set, it looks kind of like, um, in one-dimensional, right, it looks like this. It just uh, lives all along the coordinate axes. And in higher dimensions, it, it looks much more complicated than that, but it's, um, it's a very non-convex set. So what we know is that, uh, and, and again, this is a, a fact that everyone who learns principal component analysis is comfortable with, is that to get the solution to this problem, I just take this, the SVD of y. I just take the singular value composition of y, and I truncate it after the first k terms. So I throw away all the columns of u after the first k, the diagonal elements of d after the first k, and the, the columns of v after the first k, and I put it together, and I get the solution. And so this, in other words, x hat, the solution here, is the reconstruction of y from its first k principal components. And uh, I've heard this called the Eckert-Young Young theorem. Um, it's quite old. Um, and this paper says that this was even known earlier than 1936. So by the way, this, this was a time when people were not paying attention to convexity. 1936, it wasn't uh, until later that the convexity, non-convexity was an important distinction. So it's kind of cool that people knew this was all, all the way back then. So this was mysterious to me until um, Somebody, uh, Jing Li, who's, a, who's an, a professor in statistics, pointed something out to me, which was something I'm surprised that more people don't know about, but he uses for his own work, which is called the phantope. And it's another way of, um, of looking at the PCA problem that actually takes PCA and relaxes it to a convex problem where that relaxation is tight. So given that's the case, it's now not surprising that we can solve this problem with the SVD because it's kind of equivalent to a convex problem. And this, again, this is quite an old result. I think it's from the 1970s, but I didn't know about it until um, this year. So I'm just going to slightly rephrase the problem. So think of S as, um, as the sample covariance matrix of X. So X transpose X, if, I, if I've centered the columns of X. And now I'm going to rephrase it so that I want to find the minimum, uh, the minimizer overall um, matrices Z of the Frobenius norm between S and Z, so Z is P by P now, subject to Z having rank K, but Z being a projection matrix. So that's a little different from the previous formulation, but they're really going to both find you the, singular val uh, the, the right singular vectors. And so the solution here is just I take um, VK, VK transpose, where that comes from the eigen decomposition um, of Z. So if, if V is the matrix whose columns have the eigenvectors of Z, then I take just the top k, and vk, vk transpose is the projection matrix, and it minimizes this over all um, matrices z. 
And so here's the interesting relationship between this and a convex problem. And this one we'll go through a little bit carefully because I think it's, at least to me, it was surprising. So we're going to start by writing the constraint set here. This, think of this as subject to z lying in some set c as the set of all matrices z for which z has rank k and it's a projection matrix. We're going to re rewrite that as um, z equals z transpose because projection matrices need to be symmetric. The eigenvalues of z are all between 0 and 1. That's also because it's a projection matrix. Okay, so these... Yeah, either 0 or 1. I guess I said it differently. They definitely have to be either 0 or 1 for, for, every, um, for every one of its eigenvalues. And the rank of ZSVK, well, for a projection matrix, since its eigenvalues are 0 or 1, the rank is its trace. Because its trace is just going to sum up basically the number of non-zeros. Right, so trace C equals K. So these are the same sets. I've just represented it a little differently. These two make it a projection matrix. This one ha makes it have rank k. So we're going to consider taking the convex hull of this set, right? Because what we have is a problem which is a convex objective subject to z in a set. That's not a convex problem because this set's non-convex. Right? We know the rank constraint's not convex. But we're going to actually take the convex hull of c and try to solve that problem. That'll be a convex problem because the convex hull of a set is obviously convex. And so when we do that, you can see all that changes is, is that the eigenvalues restriction goes from having to be either 0 or 1 to uh, being anything between 0 and 1 inclusive. Right? So this is not that hard to show that the convex hull of the previous set is this one. And as an exercise, maybe as a study tool, you guys could try to go through that. And so I can rewrite that as, for example, the set of all z such that z equals z transpose. Um, Z is positive semi-definite, and all of its eigenvalues are less than or equal to 1, and its trace is k. So this is a convex set. Now this problem is actually an SDP. And this set is called the fantope of order k. It's the convex hull of rank k projection matrices. And the amazing result is that um, the solution to this problem, at least it's amazing in my mind, is exactly the solution to this problem, which means that even though we've taken some set C, which was non-convex, and we've, re we've relaxed our problem to, to finding um, the, the solution over the co its convex hull, what this result is saying is that the minimizer always lies at an extreme point of the convex hull. And so this is a very simple picture. This is not what it looks like in, in, uh, with matrices and in, in in with this convex hull, but this is just supposed to be a, an illustration to say that what happens when we solve the relaxed problem is that the solution always lies at an extremal point, which means that it has to be a solution of this problem because um, it, it is feasible for this problem. So there's a um, paper in 1949. I think this is called the, um, the Key Fan Fantope sometimes, or maybe the fan comes from his name, but Key Fan is the author. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, so. Jing Li, who's in statistics here, and some other people, they, they use this to um, extend uh, this, basically this formulation to doing sparse PCA. So it leads to a convex way to do sparse PCA, which is very nice. Ben, yeah. I'm wondering that you might be able to extend that to the exponential summing PCA as well. So um, I know that there's a paper that does that, that. We can think of PCA as that Gaussian noise on a low rank tempo. But uh, you might also assume that you had exponential family PCA noise then, and then instead of Frobenius norm, we had to minimize Bergman's diode tensor. And I already know a paper that relaxed exponential family, so that there's a relaxation of the exponential family PCA problem that's actually convex. I'm just wondering if there's a, a connection to this phantom. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I don't know how special the, um, the choice of spherical norm is here. I don't know. I mean, maybe intuitively it would seem like if, if the, whatever the loss was was smooth enough, right. then you'd have the same property where it hits an extremal point. But I don't know how special the, the Fabinus norm is in particular. But that's a really interesting idea. 
why don't we we'll take a break and then we can think about it in chat. So we'll, we'll take a five minute break. Picking and choosing, just of which ones to talk about. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe I'll choose one more. I'll choose one more eigenvalue problem to talk about. So multidimensional scaling is a problem that, um, in one uh, kind of formulation, is convex, and, and many others is not. So multidimensional scaling is a problem where you have, say, n points in, hi in high dimension, like in, in p-dimensional space, and you want to find um, lower dimensional points say z's, so your x's are very original points, uh, that are surrogates for those original points, x's, that are in, um, say, rk. So k is much smaller than p. You choose k. So that the, um, the structure of the z's with respect to each other is like the structure of the x's with respect to each other. That's the idea, is that I want a lower dimensional representation such that kind of I've preserved the structure and just thrown away um, uh, some dimensionality that wasn't as important. So how you actually translate that, that into an optimization problem affects whether it's convex or non-convex. So classical multidimensional scaling, this is what um, this formulation is called, uh, is a non-convex problem. I'm sorry, I must, must have maybe been misleading there. It's a non-convex problem that we can solve exactly with, um, with an eigen decomposition. So basically, what I do is I evaluate similarities between every two points by taking centered inner products. So it's like just the inner product between xi and xj. So that's higher if, if these two points are you know, closely aligned in the space. But I've subtracted off the mean of the sample, just so that I'm, I'm looking mostly at directions rather than, uh, actually, this wouldn't really even make sense if the, if the points weren't centered around 0. And so then I choose a bunch of points z to minimize the following optimization problem. Um, I look at all similarities s, i, j between my original points, and I subtract off the same um, formula for my z's, z, i minus their mean, transpose z, j minus the mean of those points, and I square those and add them up across all i, j, and I want to choose the z's that make that the smallest. So match the similarities between the z's and the x's best in terms of the least squares criterion with the similarities we take to be inner products. And so here's just a picture of how that works. So I have some points that are on, um, on a manifold here in three-dimensional space. And uh, they really kind of exhibit, a, a, say, a two-dimensional structure. They're just on this manifold plus a little bit of noise. And if I took any linear um, slices through the space to reduce the dimension, it wouldn't really um, properly uh, account for the structure. It might split up groups or make one group look way too small. But if I do this classical multidimensional scaling, these are the coordinates that it gets out. Um, so you can think of it, although it's not literally this, as projecting these points onto this manifold. And that's what gets recovered. Okay, what it's doing is that it can't find this manifold exactly, and it's, it's trying to match similarities in a way that, that it does this kind of intuitively. So like I said, you can actually solve this exactly with an eigen decomposition of the similarity matrix. So you just take an eigen decomposition of the similarity matrix, and you take the first k columns of the eigenvectors, and you multiply by the first k diagonal elements, or their, their square roots. And then that gives me exactly a, uh, the representation of these lower dimensional points. My z's are the rows of that matrix. And so in other words, this solves this problem. And again, that's pretty interesting, because this problem is not convex. It's pretty far from convex. I have like a square of I have a square of a linear function, a uh, square of a quadratic function. Um, and so what I wanted to point out, I, I guess I was saying this earlier in a way that might have been confusing, is that other forms of multidimensional scaling are not convex. This one is also not convex, but if I just change the the formulation slightly, they can be very difficult to solve. So classical multidimensional scaling is very special because it's very easy to solve. It just requires an eigen decomposition. Least squared scaling is another very kind of famous way to do multidimensional scaling. Instead of just matching similarities, I match distances. So I take dij to be the distance between my input points, and I, I try to match the distances between the z's to be the distances between my input points as best as I can, again, in squared norm across all i and j. This is just as non-convex as the other one. 
I mean, transparently, these, these aren't, um, one shouldn't be much harder than the other, but the first one leads to an explicit solution with the eigen decomposition. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this last one. More eigenvalue problems you can look at. Um, graph problems. So I think I'm going to just pick one graph problem to talk about. I wrote down two, and there are a lot of others I didn't talk about uh, because, um, well, I mean, for one, I'm not an expert on graph theory and graph algorithms, and, and for another, there's just not, there wasn't enough room in the slides as it is. So there are lots of problems in this, uh, in this category that are not convex, but that you can solve exactly. And so the first one I'll just talk about is min cut, since we kind of already talked about that with, um, when we talked about LPs. But min cut in its original formulation is not convex. Okay. Uh, people often think of the min, uh, max flow min cut theorem and then relate this to the LP. So it is true we can solve it exactly, but it is a non-convex problem in its original formulation. So I have a, a graph, uh, edges E and vertices V, and I, and I have costs on the edges, and I basically single out two nodes, S and T, and I want to uh, partition the nodes into two sets, one that contains S, one that contains T, in such a way that the cost of the edges that leave the set from S and go to T across the cut is minimal. So I want, in this example, the cost of this edge, that edge, and the top edge that go from the blue set to the other set to sum up to minimal cost among all such partitions of the nodes into two sets. So how do I formulate that? Well, I can formulate it like, like this problem. Um, I'll have Bij to be the indicator that um, the edge ij traverses the cut. And xi is going to be um, 0 if it's in s. And it's going to be 1 if I assign that node to be node i to be in the other, uh, sorry, the set containing s or the set containing t. So these indicate group membership. So s has to be in set 0 and t has to be in set 1. And like I said, the b's are the indicator variables that that edge travels across the cut. So this is non-convex because of the constraint that I have to have bij, xi, and xj all, all either 0 or 1. Okay, that's, the, um, that's the kind of most natural formulation of min cut. But it can be solved exactly using max flow. And uh, that's called the max flow min cut theorem. It's kind of a famous result. And if we take a relaxation of this min cut, so we relax this constraint, essentially, the, the binary constraint on the variables, you'll see that it turns into something like this, where actually all I require is positivity of b component-wise. So this is now an LP. My variables are b and x. And um, interestingly, this is the dual of the max flow LP. Okay, so um, if I take the dual of this problem, I get the max flow problem. So be, well, from what we know about LPs, these two things have the same optimal criterion value, and we can get the solutions of one from the other because we have strong duality for LPs um, since these two problems are feasible. Uh, and so remember the relationship is that, let's write it out here, um, the optimal value of um, the min cut problem, it's a maximization problem, right? It's less than or equal to the optimal value of the relaxed min cut problem, because by relaxing it, I've made its constraint set larger. So um, wait, I'm sorry. It's a minimization problem, so that probably confused you. By, it's a minimization problem, so I made its constraint set larger, so I can only achieve a smaller value of the objective function. And because it's the dual of the max flow LP, or because max flow is its dual, basically, I also have this inequality, optimal value of max flow. In fact, we know these two are equal, right, um, from strong duality. Doesn't really matter. But the point I'm trying to make is that these two are equal from the max flow min cut theorem. So that also makes this inequality, right? So all these optimal values are equal. And in particular, I can relax min cut to this LP, and I know that I haven't changed the solution. It's another example of a 
convex problem, I can relax to a, uh, a non-convex problem, and I can relax to a convex problem, this case being an LP, and the relaxation is tight. Okay, um, shortest path is another good example of a non-convex problem you can solve exac exactly, um, depends exactly what problem you're talking about, but here I was talking about um, single source shortest path, so finding the shortest path from any one fixed node to every other node in the graph, that's non-convex, and uh, you can do it using uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, for example. Okay, so here's a, a, some, a couple non-standard ones. Um, non-convex prox operators. So this is one that's, uh, okay, th I have to say we're starting very simple with hard thresholding. Um, let's suppose my prox operator was just the L0 norm, or something like that. Okay, so I was taking the indicator for some indicators that every variable was not equal to zero. And I could even uh, assign that its own tuning parameter lambda i. And so this problem is not convex, right? This is clearly not a convex function, being zero or zero or this is actually going to be zero or one, this indicator. And the solution though is given by hard thresholding. So I can see that actually directly by just inspecting the solution to the problem. Um, we can just go through that right now. First of all, I can minimize this over every i independently because it decouples, right? There's no appearance of um, any other variable j in the terms that involve i. So I'll just think about the minimum for beta i individually. And let's suppose that somebody had a, pr a proposed solution. And uh, we're going to see if beta um, i was 0 or not. So if beta i was, um, was 0, then uh, so if beta i wasn't 0, Right, then this term is always going to be equal to lambda i in the i-th term. It doesn't matter how large it gets. So to make the criterion as small as possible, I better make um, y i equal to beta i. I better choose beta i equal to y i. Otherwise, I'm incurring loss for no reason because the penalty is the same no matter how large it gets. In that case, the loss I uh, encounter is just um, the penalty, it's just lambda i, because this term was made 0. And now if I decide to make beta um, i0, I encounter a loss of yi squared. Right, so I just really have to choose between either calling it 0, in which case it's yi squared, or not 0. But if it's not 0, I know exactly what to choose, and that's yi, and the loss is lambda i. So this is just choosing between those two cases. If it's large enough compared to lambda i, I call it yi, otherwise I call it 0. Okay, so a special case of this is when all these lambda i's are lambda, and I can write the problem like this. This just sums the number of non-zeros in beta. And so just compare this in your mind to soft thresholding, which is the prox operator for the L1 penalty. Right, this doesn't subtract off any amount from yi. It just leaves it alone if it's big enough, or it sets it to 0. Okay, so it looks like this. At um, the value square root of y lambda i and minus square root of lambda i, I either uh, call it exactly equal to the input yi. That's the solution as a function of yi. Otherwise, I just call it zero. Okay, that's the hard thresholding operator. Soft thresholding would actually look like this. Right? It subtracts it by a constant amount um, so that it's continuous. Although I don't really want to draw it because the value of lambda at which it thresholds is different. It's just there's no square root. OK, so that was a very easy um, non-convex prox operator. Here's a very, I think, a very surprising non-convex prox operator that we can solve exactly. So this is a one-dimensional L0 segmentation problem. So I have the penalty now being the uh, sum of number of jump points in beta. So I think about lying out y1 through yn on a line. And I discount number of times that beta1 is not equal to beta 2, beta 2 is not equal to beta 3, et cetera. That's the number of times that there's a jump, basically, in this sequence of betas as I lay them out along a line. So it's like a segmentation problem. If I make lambda large enough, then um, I'm going to force a lot of betas to be exactly equal to their neighbors. Otherwise, I'll have more jumps. We saw a convex relaxation of this a number of times in class where the penalty just looks like 
the absolute value of beta i minus beta i plus 1. Right? That was, we call that the 1 diffuse lasso or 1D total variation denoising. This is the L0 analog. Turns out you can actually solve this problem exactly um, using dynamic programming. And there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first is quite an old paper um, by Bellman called On the Approximation of Curves by Line Segments Using Dynamic Programming. And it does actually this problem in a slightly more general framework. Um, and the second is a paper that's very recent. Uh, was published this year, which proposes a different dynamic programming to solve this problem. And the latter paper is actually much more efficient. It's practical. You can run it for pretty large values of n. But it's less general. So the Bellman dynamic programming approach can solve more than just this problem. And so the worst case performance of this algorithm, this dynamic programming problem, for solving this exactly is n squared. Um, but its practical performance is more like order n. So that you should take a look at this paper if you're interested. And again, another interesting thing to point out is that um, both of these algorithms, uh, they are direct algorithms for solving this problem. And by that, I mean that you don't pass it a tolerance and that you get back a solution that's within a certain tolerance of the optimal value. You get back exactly the solution up to computer precision. So it's pretty amazing that you can solve this non-convex problem with a direct algorithm. But the algorithm is, is very complicated. Uh, to explain at least, um, yeah. So you should take a look at these papers if you're interested. So here's an example of it being fit. Um, unlike the, the one diffuse lasso, you can see it doesn't uh, basically shift the estimated segments towards each other. When we use the one diffuse lasso, because of uh, this choice of L1 penalty, we incur some kind of bias in that the estimated segments get pushed towards each other. That doesn't happen here because it's either just zero or it's one. So it doesn't matter how large we make them when they're different. So here's another nice one um, that I just learned about last night uh, from uh, Miguel uh, Carrera Perpignan, who's, who's visiting us actually this semester um, from UC Merced. Um, and uh, so M Miguel does a lot of interesting work with non-convex optimization problems. Um, and so you should take a chance to talk to him soon if you're interested in learning about it, because he's leaving the start of December. But, um, but this is a, basically a subroutine and a larger kind of broader algorithm that, that he's designed for doing non-convex optimization. And it turns out that this subroutine uh, is an important step that he can solve exactly, um, even though it's non-convex. So it's a prox operator, just like the other ones. But the, uh, the function now, our penalty function, is um, the indicator function that a certain tree uh, does not assign whatever optimization variable is a label. Like think of this as um, one. So we have some target u. You, you also have some tree g. So you can feed it any n-dimensional point and it'll produce a label at one of its leaves. And we want to find the point z that's close to u, weighted by the fact that the, the uh, tree g should also um, assign z to be a label that's consistent with y. Okay, and so we can think of this um, as before. We can argue directly that the solution is either going to be just exactly u, or it's going to be the closest point in the set of leaves for that tree that I've labeled, say, 1, if we're thinking of y as 1, to u. Because otherwise, there'd be no point um, in choosing anything else. Right, so for example, if this penalty is not 0, then um, I better make this term as small as possible because it's always just going to be 1. So I choose it equal to uh, u, exactly. And if this penalty term is 0, then to make this term as small as possible, I have to, find the, I have to basically project u onto the set of points that the tree is going to assign a label of y. So we're going to call that set s. It's the set of inputs that I give to the tree that at the end of the, end of the day end up getting a label of y. And um, what this comes down to then is just project, is projecting u onto that set, s. And so we'll compute that, and we'll, we'll just compute the cost of u as well. We'll compare those two costs with respect to this criterion. And whatever is smaller, we'll call our solution. And so, um, so okay, if we have a tree, right, then uh, its leaves, um, by nature of the way that we design uh, classification trees, using like a cart algorithm is that 
these end up being um, axis-aligned rectangles in our feature space. So I just drew a simple picture here where I split on a bunch of variables to get different regions. And so each one of these leaves corresponds to a certain region in the feature space. And um, I'll, I would have assigned each one of these a label, too. So for example, the set of inputs that might have um, been labeled a 1 could be R1, R3, and R5. So S is the union of all these three, R1, R3, and R5. So that's a non-convex set in feature space, right? It looks the union of those three boxes. And what we want is we want to project some point onto that set. Okay, so I just drew this again so you could keep the picture in mind. Um, so this is, this is recent work of Miguel's. Uh, you can, for example, you could just project uh, S onto all the boxes. Right? On any one box, it's easy. I just do um, truncation, basically. We learned about that already when we talked about the prox operator for the L infinity norm. Um, but that's obviously not going to be the fastest way. One slightly faster way is just to look at all the boxes that have label 1, of course, right, and, uh, and project onto those because those are the only ones we care about. And a, a, a kind of more elegant way that, um, that you, what you can use is the following. Um, we can actually use the tree to help guide us as to which box to project on. So we can rule out lots of boxes on the fly by doing depth first search through the tree. And the way we do it is as follows. For every internal node of the tree, we're going to label it by, um, we're going to collect all the labels of its leaves. So like zeros or ones if it's leaves. Um, right, so for example, for this one, I would assign it the label of the regions 3, 4, and 5, and I'd collect them here. And I also would, would think of a bounding box for this region. So this contains. 3, 4, and 5 as its leaves. So the bounding box for this internal node here is just this box right here. Right? It, it's it's a, a bounding box for the union of R3, R4, and R5. And so I go through and I label all the internal nodes with these qualities. Bounding box for its uh, regions at its leaves and also the labels of its leaves. And then I do depth first search on the tree. And at any node, I look, does it have um, a leaf that contains, say, 1, again, if y was 1. If it doesn't, I just prune that node, and every, I don't have to consider any of its leaves. And the second question I ask is, um, is the projection onto the bounding box for that internal node, so all of this, farther away than it is for the current closest box? You keep a running total of what the closest projection onto the closest bounding box is. If it's farther away, then it's only going to get farther away as I look at projections onto individual regions within that bounding box. So I also can print away that whole node and all of it uh, that, in that subtree. So by doing depth first search through this tree, I can rule out actually entire sections of the feature space. And it's, uh, it's a very efficient projection onto um, a set of tree leaves. And so you can check out um, this paper here. And there will be a more recent one on archive, I think I was told. It's going to describe this in more detail. All right, so I probably have time to talk about one or two more problems. So I'm going to, let's take a, just a quick poll. Um, I can talk about discrete problems, or infinite dimensional problems, or statistical problems. How many people want to hear uh, discrete problems? Infinite dimensional problems, and uh, statistical problems. OK, so I'll try to maybe do one of, one of each. So discrete <laughs> was cut. Uh, you'll, you can look through discrete. There's some nice problems there. Infinite dimensional problems. Um, so the, the classic example that I'm aware of in statistics of an infinite dimensional problem that we solve exactly is the smoothing spline problem. And it's actually a pretty interesting uh, result. So let's suppose you have pairs xi, yi, and I want to do function estimation uh, in a non-parametric fashion. So I just want to fit a function through you know, some sequence of points. So x's are, are on the x-axis here and y's on the y-axis that has a good property. And the properties I'm looking for is that it has to fit the points x well to y. And it can't be too wiggly. And so I make that precise by saying I'm going to penalize the derivative order k plus 1 over 2 squared when I take its integral. So if it's very wiggly with respect to this derivative, this will be very large. And I'll take the integral of a large quantity. And so that'll look bad with respect to this penalty. So this penalty is, is going to enforce it to be smooth with respect to some higher order derivatives. So it won't be doing this if I make lambda large enough. 
So we're doing something smooth. And so for smoothing splines, I actually I specify a value of k, like some odd value of k has to be odd, like think uh, 3. So then I, I penalize the integral of the second derivative of f squared across all the input points. So this is an infinite dimensional problem because my minimization domain is just functions. It's any functions for which this penalty is finite. Okay, as an aside, it is convex in function space. These are both convex functions in function space, but it's infinite dimensional. So you know, we would be, at this point, we would not know how to solve this. Um, one kind of remarkable result that came from um, you know, some very kind of classic and old literature is that the solution to this problem is unique, first of all. And second of all, it's given by a natural spline of order k. So that's a piecewise polynomial of order k um, that has continuous lower order derivatives at the input points and that has knots at the data points. So it actually characterizes the solution in a very specific form. It's a natural spline with knots at the data points. So it could only change in its uh, higher order derivative, the highest order derivative, uh, the k plus first one, at the input points. So what I do is I just take some basis, I'll call it a to 1 through a to n, for the space of uh, natural splines of order k with knots at the input, at the input points. And that's going to be an n-dimensional space. So that's just a fact you'll have to believe me uh, about for now. And I always, I can, because the solution is a, is a natural spline, I can always write it as a linear combination of these basis functions. And so now I actually plug this in the optimization problem up there. And I just solve in terms of theta, theta j's. And I only have n theta j's, so this is a finite dimensional optimization problem. I've reduced this, which is over functions, to a problem that looks like this, which is just finding n coefficients in the basis expansion of f. And actually, it ends up looking like a ridge regression problem, just like a generalized ridge regression problem, where these matrices are given explicitly in terms of the basis functions. So you can compute them once you know the basis. And uh, if I have, um, this is the explicit solution for this problem. If I choose the basis cleverly, I can actually compute this in order n time. So putting this all together is a pretty remarkable result, which, which says that um, with the proper choice of basis, I can solve this infinite dimensional minimization problem in order n time. And it's a very fast order n. It's like actually 35n is what I've heard it called. That's the constant. And so um, there's a bunch of references here. I'll just skip ahead to a picture of what it looks like. And it's, this is in blue here, smoothing splines on the left. Um, Statistical problems, I'm going to jump to that. I'm going to skip over the other informational problems. Take a look at them if you're interested. Here's one statistical problem. Um, and maybe it's appropriate to end on this because we kind of be, we begun the class on a similar example, the first lecture. So let's suppose I have a linear system of, of, of equations, x beta equals y. I'm given x and I'm given y. And I want to find the solution to that that's sparsest, that has the fewest number of non-zero elements. So I want to minimize overall vectors beta, the L0, L0 norm of beta subject to it being a solution to this linear equation. That's generically an NP-hard problem. Okay, and a lot of combinatorial problems can be reduced to this one. So it's a pretty um, well-studied NP-hard problem. A very natural thing to do, we've done it all throughout the course, and we've looked at the last whole bunch of times, is just to take this L0 norm and to make it an L1 norm, right? and to try to solve this problem. And it's going to give us something sparse. Whether it's the sparsest solution you know, whether it's, it's going to be the solution to this problem, we don't know. Well, there's a pretty remarkable result that connects these two. Um, and it started off around the time of this paper. So I'm going to cite results from this paper. But the literature has grown kind of immense since then. And uh, so you'll, you can look at a review paper that I cited on the next page to keep up with the current um, research that connects these two. But here's the, here's the statement from this paper. If I let n and p grow large, and I look at p bigger than n, so I, I do have an underdetermined linear system, which there could be many solutions, then there is some threshold, rho. Um, and this is precisely determined as a function of uh, kind of parameters of the problem that depends on the ratio p over n, such that for most matrices x, if I just look at most um, matrices x, and I solve the L1 problem, I look at its solution, if the solution I get back has less than rho n compo uh, non-zero components, 
then that's the unique solution of the L0 problem. So what I found actually solves the L0 problem exactly, and it's the only one that solves it. If it comes back with greater than uh, row n non-zero components, then there's no solution of the L0 problem that's going to have less than this number of non-zero components. So it's not like we're doing much worse anyways than solving the L1 problem. Okay, so this is a pretty remarkable statement because it says that um, we can solve an NP-hard problem most of the time if by most we're willing to interpret um, draw matrices x from some large set of matrices, and most means high probability over that set. So it's a low probability that if I, if I draw a matrix from some large set of matrices, that I get a matrix x for which this doesn't hold. But for most of the matrices in this large set, I'll get this, um, this property. And like I said, there's a very kind of large and fast-moving body of literature. And there are more complicated, but even kind of more powerful statements than this um, that people are currently pursuing. So I guess that wraps it up. There's a ton of slides I didn't cover. Take a look at them if you want. Come to office hours to ask about them. Um, see you next Tuesday. <laughs>